or if you were someone on the street and you've had a brawl with someone due to conflict or perhaps you've had a fight with a spouse or a neighbor or a family member cousin a brother I think we've all had fights we've all have conflicts with people whether they're your co-workers your boss the person behind the counter We've experienced these things before, but specifically, we want to talk about today the fights and the quarrels that happen in the brotherhood, in the church, among people that profess to believe God and trust God and do His will. So turn with me to the book of James, chapter 4, chapter 4. <clears throat> And we'll be looking at a number of verses here to enlighten ourselves, to help ourselves understand where the source of these quarrels and conflicts come from. Let us begin. Verse 1, chapter 4. What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is it is not the source of is not the source your pleasures that wage war in your members these two questions are going to be answered thoughtfully and directly by our brother James so please keep in mind that you're going to answer these questions for yourself and for other people you lust, and you do not have, so you commit murder. The emphasis here is you. You may not see it yet, but in the text, it's you. It's your lust. It's your desire. That's all that lust means. It's, it's your desire. It's you personally that has this desire. And because you do not have what you desire, you commit a murder. You are envious, the text says, and cannot obtain. So you fight and quarrel. So there we have it. In part, we have part of the answer. Because you have this envy in your heart, you have this zeal in your heart for this, and you do not obtain it, so what do you do? You fight about it. You quarrel about it. You have a desire, you lust, and you do not have, so you commit murder. So if you don't get what you want when you want it, you want to start an argument. You want to start a fight. It's because of what you want. And this really applies to every relationship that we have. Daughters to fathers, husbands to wives, everyone. It's because of your own desire that these come about, your personal desires. And it says, you do not have because you don't ask. Now, we'll come to the answer, but I'll give it to you ahead of time. The asking is of God. And so, the situation here is what? We have some brethren, some people that profess to believe in God, and they have their own desires. And they say to God, God, this is what I want. And it is because of their own desires that they are also quarreling. The text says, you ask. You ask and you do not receive. Because you ask with wrong motives. So that you may spend it on your pleasures. You see, it's flipping back around again. It's telling us again. The problem is you. The problem is because of your desires that you don't get what you want, that you want to start a fight, 
that you want to argue, that you want to bicker, that you want to cause problems in the brotherhood because you're not getting what you want. Now, this makes sense in in relationships, and it makes sense in the word of God. If we just look back a few verses in chapter three, we can see some evidence of how this makes sense. Notice the wisdom of God. Verse 17 of chapter three. What does it say? It says it's pure. That's innocent. Without fault. It says it's peaceable. We just finished singing songs and praise to our master. And we sung beautiful songs that came from our heart. And in singing, you have parts. You have soprano, alto, tenor, bass. When people sing together, there's harmony. This idea of peace is harmonious relationship. Harmony. Now, the word of God is going to harmonize with the self. If everyone is doing that which is of God, it's going to be harmonious. But then when you have that person, perhaps I'm not saying anything about anyone here, but when you have that person who may be off key, it draws your attention. There's a bit of a conflict there with the sound. It's no longer harmonious. When you have your own desires, it produces conflict because the word of God is all going to be peaceable. It's going to it's going to agree with itself. So if you are taking in the wisdom of God, we're all going to have this harmonious relationship. There's not going to be any conflicts there. It makes sense. The text says. You ask with wrong motives. You ask with wrong motives. So then, what are those motives? What really the text literally is saying, you ask wickedly. That may ring some bells in your mind. When someone is wicked, they are evil. You ask with evil motives. Again, we can look back in the text and we can see some things about where this motivation or these motives come from. It says, chapter 3, verse 15 and 16. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, natural, and demonic. Demonic, demon like. For jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder in every evil thing. So you see, there's a stark contrast, there's a difference. When you get your wisdom from yourself, from the world around you, that wisdom is nothing but natural, earthly, and demonic. It is of this world. That wisdom is going to stir conflict because you got this man over here or this one over here saying, I want what I want, and you haven't given it to me. And then you got this opinion over here saying, I want what I want, and you haven't given it to me. And you know what happens? You have conflict. You have problems in your relationship. Is not a relationship between a man and a woman who are in the body of Christ. They are both brethren in a sense because they are of like mind. And so if you have a relationship in which two people are arguing, it's because one of them is trying to get their way, not the way of God. Not the way of God is not the source of your pleasures that wage war in your members. And it says again in the text, verse 3, you ask so that you can spend it on your pleasures. It's all about what you want. You adulteresses, 
An adulteress is simply a person that is married. And they then go about, in contemporary terms, cheating on their spouse. But that's not exactly what this term is talking about here. This is spiritual adultery. Spiritual adultery is when you are in a relationship with God and then you give yourself to someone else. And this, you are giving yourself to the world. And that is spiritual adultery. That's not permitted. It says, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? You are striving against God. That's strife. That is hostility against God. Wow. So this adultery of accepting this worldly thinking, this natural, demonic, earthly thinking, that's building conflicts among the brotherhood, in your house, in the churches, is hostility toward God, and you have committed a spiritual adultery. It says in the text, Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Makes himself an enemy of the God who created you by the word of truth. Makes himself an enemy of the God who flooded this world and saved the eight. Makes himself an enemy of the God who opened up the earth and swallowed the thousands of people. Makes himself an enemy of God who sent the plagues on Egypt. Makes himself an en enemy of God who turned back that sundial when Hezekiah was sick to give him ten more years. Makes the himself an enemy of God who raised people from the dead. You are an enemy of God when you accept the wisdom of the world. The text says, verse 5, Or do you think that the scripture speaks to no purpose? He jealously desires the spirit which he made to dwell in us. Our creator, the one who sent his son, he desires our spirit. He does not want us to give ourselves up to the world, be friends with the world, committing this spiritual adultery, accepting this wisdom that draws conflict in us and quarrels and, and murders. The text says, verse 6, but he gives a greater grace, greater than him just jealously yearning the spirit within us. Therefore, it says, God opposed the proud, but gives grace to the humble. He gives his divine favor, his divine favor, his blessings to those who are humbled, to those who are lowly, those who humble themselves to the superiority of God. Listen to this. God is telling us that you are proud in your heart. You are proud in your heart when you as a, a professed Christian, you go to God saying, Lord, give me what I want. Because I know what I want to spend it on what I want to do. Do you not know that God created the world that God created you and you're going to tell him what you want to spend on your pleasures? It's about what he wants. It's about his will, his wisdom. His wisdom is pure. His wisdom is peaceable. His wisdom is full of mercy. His wisdom is filled with good fruits. His wisdom is unwavering. His wisdom is without hypocrisy. You want to prevent some of these conflicts you have in your household, in the church? 
figure out who's doing things because they want to do it and not because of what God wants. And you'll find your problem. You'll find selfish ambition. You'll find jealousy. You'll find every evil thing in that person. And so the text says, verse 7, it says, submit, put yourself in subjection to the God of heaven and earth. Submit, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. And this makes sense. This makes sense, even in a physical sense. You got a point that's staying stationary, and you draw near to God. Look at this. You got a point, and you're staying stationary, and you draw near to God, you're going to get closer to Him. And He's going to get closer to you. Or you could think about it another way. You're drawing near to God, and He's drawing near to you. Either way, you're drawing near to God, but you got to submit. You got to put yourself into subjection to his wisdom over this, this, this stuff in the world. Because this stuff is demonic. This stuff is going to bring about selfish ambition. For those of you that took the journey with me through the book of Philippians, we talked about some people like this, didn't we? We talked about some of those evil workers. Some people have asked me, how can a person be an evil worker and still be called a brethren? Well, here's part, partly how that can happen. Because they are called brethren, but they're so proud in their heart that they're looking to their own desires to fulfill what they want to do, not the will of God. Their God is their appetite. Their God is what they want to do because they accept the wisdom of the world. As what needs to be done. They accept the philosophies of men. As what needs to be done. They are giving in to this evil motive. It says cleanse. Verse 8. Cleanse your hands. You sinners. Purify your hearts. You double minded. You know, when one purifies gold, it is put through fire. When you purify yourself with the word of God, you need to get rid of that earthly thinking. That's what you got to do. You purify, you get rid of the dross. There's a process in, in gold in which they have to purify it, they melt it, and there's a stuff called dross. It floats to the top, they scrape it off, and then they have pure gold. In this case... It's the wisdom of the world that's the dross. The wisdom of the world is what you need to get rid of. And we'll talk about a, a big idea here in a moment. It says you double-minded. That literally means you have two minds. One in which you are obeying the world and one in which you are trying to obey God. But you know what? It's not going to work. It's not going to work. Because you have to have a pure heart in order to be pleasing to God. A pure heart. Matthew chapter 5, it talks about the blessed. Some of you have heard it called the Beatitudes. There's one that says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. You ever wonder how to do that? You ever wonder how to be blessed by God so that you can see him? This is what you do. This is the how. For those of you that emphasize the how and want to know, how do I do this? How do I do this? How do I be what God wants me to be? How do I be pure? This is the how. If you want a step-by-step -step guide on how to be a pure of heart so that you can see God, here it is. If you want a step-by-step -step guide on how to... Not have the conflicts and quarrels and the problems in the brotherhood. There you go. Everybody needs to be on the same page with doing the wisdom of God. The wisdom of God. Not the wisdom of this earth. Verse 9. Be miserable and mourn. 
and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy gloom. That's the sinner, of course. That's the sinner. The sinner needs to be miserable and mourn and weep. The sinner needs to let their laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom because of your sin. It says the godly sorrow leads to repentance, doesn't it? So if you found yourself in this position of having accepted the wisdom of the world, thinking that it's the right thing to do, and you found yourself in the middle of having conflicts with somebody, you need to reflect on this and ask yourself, are you the one that's accepted the wisdom, this demonic, this earthly, this natural wisdom, if we can call it wisdom, and are the source of the problem? Or perhaps it's someone else. Show them these scriptures. And so it says, Humble yourself. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. Next slide. Turn, please, to Matthew chapter 18, and we'll close with this. Matthew chapter 18, verse 1 through 4. At that time... The disciples came to Jesus and said, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And he called a child to himself and set him before them. Verse 3. And said, Truly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever then humbles himself as this child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. All those who are striving to not have conflicts in your marriage, with your children, with your family, with your cousins, with the brethren and the sisters, Universal. Humble yourselves in the sight of God. Become like children in his sight, having your spirit cry out, Father, that he may exalt you and lift you up. Because God is opposed to the proud, but exalts the humble. So let us take this lesson of humility and not be proud in our hearts, but be obedient to our master who rules our life, not accepting the wisdom of the world, but rather the wisdom of God that is pure, peaceable, full of mercy, full of good fruits, unwavering and without hypocrisy. I give you the message. If anyone needs any prayer,